Greetings. Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. And it's great to have the guests we have here today because it's been 125 years since the splendid little war known as the Spanish-American War. Um, and of course, the great naval figure that arises from that is uh, Comm Commodore George Dewey. And Lord knows he's overdue for uh, a book about him. And luckily, we have a book now, courtesy of the Naval Institute Press. A New Force at Sea, George Dewey and the Rise of the American Navy. And we are pleased to offer an excerpt from this wonderful new book in the current issue of Naval History Magazine, the June issue. Uh, we focused in the article in the magazine on the chapter dealing with the Battle of Manila. So here uh, to tell us all about George Dewey is Dr. David A. Smith. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Hi, hey, Eric. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. So like we were saying, um, Dewey's kind of overdue for something, uh, for a book treatment. So this is a very well timely uh, project. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit of how you uh, came into this and uh, got, got the ball rolling on it. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. You know, Dewey and the Spanish-American War, the 1890s, that's something that I always teach every time I do the U.S. survey class, which is every semester. And I, I realize that I talk about Dewey uh, quite a bit, and I, I regard him within my classes as this pivotal figure. And after I finished my biography of Audie Murphy, I was sort of fishing around trying to think about what I wanted to write about. And the idea of doing a biography of Dewey just sort of slowly coalesced in my head. I, there was not one morning that I woke up and said, I'm going to write about George Dewey. But it, it just sort of came about that this is what I want to do, and this is what I think would be a good story. And it turned out to be an even better story than I thought. Yes, he's, a, he's quite a dynamic individual. And um, we actually have a signed um, by Dewey photograph of him here in the Institute, uh, hung in my office oh, wow. for a while. I kind of miss it. Nice. It's kind of neat, yeah. Um, he was quite the national hero uh, in the wake of the Spanish-American War. Yeah, absolutely. There was there was nobody like him in terms of culture, in terms of heroism. There was nobody like him really since Ulysses S. Grant. And there wouldn't be anyone like him for decades. Dewey came along with his celebrity right at the exact moment that American culture was shifting into what I would call a pop culture setting. And, and it turned him into a celebrity. One of the things I talk about in the book is that he's really the first celebrity of the modern age. What an interesting thought. The first celebrity of the modern age is a naval hero. Exactly. I love that. You know, he's, he, he's this, and, and people that were talking about him, even before he got back to the United States, people were saying he was presidential material. You know, people were writing him letters and saying, we want you to be president in 1900. And someone said, you know, we've had generals as president, but we've never have a, we've never had an admiral. So now is the time to have an admiral president. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that his um, he was the fact he, his Catholic faith was the reason that he um, it was considered like uh, not tenable for him to run. But otherwise, he was perfect for it, you know, in every way, shape and form. Yeah, is there he, truth to he, that, do you know, or? Uh, he wasn't Catholic. He was what well, he was basically Episcopalian. He married a Catholic when he got back from the war. He married a wealthy Washington socialite who was a Catholic. And Maybe that that, was it. that's what turned a lot of people against him. You know, in, mm -hmm. in finding out that he was a celebrity, he also experienced how fast celebrity can sort of dry up and blow away. And when he got married to this to this wealthy Catholic socialite, a, a lot of people really turned on him, especially when he put the house that the country had given him into her name, that's when everything started to go wrong. But, mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, he wasn't, he wasn't political. You know, he, he had never voted in a presidential election ever. And he didn't have any political sense at all. And he was prone to making what we would call gaffes that were just just ridiculous. Basically, at one point in, in 1900, he said he would run, he would run for president for whichever party decided to nominate him. So he, he wasn't really good, what we would call presidential material. Right. In a sense that a political um, streak is actually an admirable thing in some ways, here, especially here. as a military leader. But in terms of a, um, a burgeoning possible po political career, clearly 
Yeah, this looks a little bit in the way. I of mean, it. he made he made Ulysses S. Grant look like a political genius, which is mm -hmm. hard to do. <laughs> well, he certainly um, showed his medal in the um, in the Battle of Manila. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I was um, reminded anew reading your article, which, by the way, folks, it's not only a good historical account; it's uh, quite engagingly written, and I commend the author for that. Uh, it's a well, nicely written piece of work, thanks. as is the book. Um, the, the way that he just held his fire and the sailors are going nuts, you know, the salvos mm -hmm. are coming in from the Spanish and, you know, he just total like battle of Bunker Hill. Don't fire to see the whites of their eyes. He's exactly. waiting. For, finally, they get into, you know, when a shell finally goes overhead, he's like, okay, now Captain Gridley, <laughs> let go, let it go. And the, exactly. it's just the tension that builds and you can sense that on the decks. Yeah. As they're getting really fired at. You know, he, he was worried about his ammunition. I mean, from the time he left California to come across the Pacific and take command of the squadron, he was worried about ammunition. And and one of the you know, when they when they ran the guns at the mouth of Manila Bay the evening before, he didn't want anybody shooting back. He didn't want to waste any ammunition at all. And he said, you know, we're not going to fire until we get in range to the point where we can make every shot count. And mm -hmm. it, it, like you said, it drove his crew crazy because they were right. getting hit. They were getting splashed. It was terrible. And then finally he said, OK, we're ready. You may fire when ready, Captain Gridley. One of the great yeah. classic, famous, immortal lines of U.S. naval history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, it the way they just kind of mopped up operations at the, in the wake of the battle, coming in close to the harbor and um, shooting mm -hmm. down the Spanish flags. And I was touched by the way he ordered a Spanish song to be played out over the harbor and its defeat instead right. of a obvious American rousing song. Um, I thought that showed a certain uh, empathy to the defeated. Yeah, he has a, he has a compassionate streak in him. You know, he's, he's a, an ardent, he's a good fighter, you know, but, when the battle's over, he understands that uh, you know people deserve compassion, and he brought the squadron back up, you know, off the off the wharfs at Manila, and he had his, you know, the band for the Olympia play Spanish songs. He was a music nut. He just loved music. He loved bands. He loved you know performances. He went to operas and plays, uh, and and he knew how to sort of set a scene. And for whatever reason, whatever clicked in his head, he knew that Spanish tunes would be the thing to play that night as the Spanish fleet smoldered, you know, down south in Manila Bay. Right. A real sense of nuance and um, and all that. Why don't we go back and uh, you tell us about his um, early childhood, his upbringing, his background? Yeah, exactly. You know, he was born in 1837 in Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, his father was a doctor. His father was a very prominent uh, citizen, a very prominent person in Montpelier. And, uh, and, and George Dewey was the third son of Dr. Dewey and his wife. He had a son Charles, a son Edward, that were both quite a bit older than George. And, uh, and then a daughter came along. So George Dewey and his little sister were always sort of a, a really close duo. And his older brothers were, you know, elsewhere. Um, uh, he, he was not, he was not a child prone to towing the line. He was, uh, rambunctious. He got in trouble a lot. He, he, you know, he got in fights. He didn't obey very well. His mother died when he was five and his father raised him as a, as a widower for, for several years before he was remarried. And for some reason, Young George had a had a hot streak, had a, a a rash spirit, and it began to bother his father a lot. His father began to to begin to worry that George wasn't sort of growing up. You know, George was still getting in trouble. Even at one point, he says, OK, look, I'm going to send you away to a military academy and maybe that'll help. And he sends him to Norwich University, Norwich Academy. And, and that helps a little bit, but still he, he winds up getting in trouble there, George does, and, and getting disciplined. And his father comes down and yanks him out and says, look, I'm going to cast you adrift and you're going to have to fend for yourself. 
And that's the point at which George Dewey tells his father, I want to go into the military. And his father's jaw drops because there's nothing, you know, in, in the good doctor's history that would, that would countenance that. Uh, there's not a spot available at West Point. And this, this is in 1853, 54. There's not a spot available at West Point. Initially, there was not a spot available at the Naval Academy either. But one of the two spots from Vermont to the Naval Academy came open. A, a kid who had been nominated decided he didn't want to go. He wanted to go into the priesthood. And because of Dr. Dewey's connections, uh, he, he got George that spot. And George entered the Naval Academy in 1854 changed his life. How about that? If that other kid hadn't dropped out to uh, pursue the priesthood, yeah, naval history would be completely different. You know, you, when you when you study history, and you know this, right? When you study history, when you read a lot of history, you realize how much of it just hangs on these little contingencies. And, and that's what makes it fun. That's one of the most fascinating things about it, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing how history is rife with such things. Um, there's always another one right around the corner that mm -hmm. you stumble on. And this is right. a good one right here. Yeah. So how was his uh, time at the Academy? How did he do here? Uh, he really found himself at the Academy. Uh, the Academy was really, really good for him. Uh, it, it took away his rambunctious streak. It brought him in line. It sort of let all of his, uh, oh, sort of inherent military qualities come out. He had a great sense of duty. He, he had a very strong sense of duty. That, and the, the, the Naval Academy allowed that to blossom. Uh, he, he had a, he was very formal, you know, he liked his quarters cleaned. He liked his clothes pressed and, 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 and sharp. And he liked to, I'm going to say it this way. And, and it's, it may sound strange. He liked to follow orders. He, he had, like I said, he had a strong sense of duty and he had, uh, he had a good sense of, understanding himself in a uh, in a continuum right from top to bottom from commander to commanded and the naval academy really allowed that to flourish and he came out he graduated in 58 and he was graduated at the top of his class and he was a very good officer fascinating it sounds like the structure he found at annapolis is exactly what had been missing yeah i, I think that's right. youth. I, so I think that's well said with all those positive energies yeah, I, I think that um, I, I'm not a psychologist, but I think that after his mom died, he was sort of adrift for a while and yeah. and he began to react against his father. His father was so upright and his father was so well respected in the town and everybody knew that George was the good doctor's son. His nickname was Doc, in fact. Hmm. And I think early in life, he he chose. Well, I don't know if choose is the right word. He misbehaved in order to come out from under his father's shadow. And at the Naval Academy, he realized there was another way to do that. And, and it, it turned him into a, a really, really good officer. So what about his Naval career um, after he's commissioned and leading up to the 1890s? Uh, well, he fought in the Civil War. He saw a lot of action in the Civil War. You know, He was initially assigned to blockade duty in the Gulf. And then he get the ship he's on, the USS Mississippi, under the command of a Captain Smith, gets attached to Farragut's fleet that Farragut is taking up the Mississippi to take the city of New Orleans. And uh, and and Dewey gets swept into that. It, it was one of the most important elements of his life, you know, that he he gets to he gets to be under fire. I don't know if gets to be under fire is the right word. He found he finds himself under fire early on. You know, he's uh, 23, 24. Uh, Captain Smith has an enormous amount of confidence in Dewey. Dewey comes up to be the executive officer of the Mississippi. And and Dewey and Captain Smith have a really good relationship. And Smith gives him an enormous amount of responsibility. And Dewey handles it all perfectly. Uh, he gets to know Farragut, and Farragut is, I, I make the conjecture in the book that Farragut becomes a, a father figure for him. Hmm. Uh, the way that Farragut commands a squadron, the, the way that Farragut deals with subordinates, the way that Farragut deals with people under him, all the way down to, you know, to, to, the, to, the, to the sailors on the ships, 
it is an inspiration to Dewey. And you're going to see Farragut-like qualities in Dewey from then on out. Um, uh, he, he's, he gets under fire. Well, first of all, Smith allows him to drive the, you know, to steer the ship, to command the ship, basically, hmm. as they go up the river under the guns of two forts on the Mississippi, about 80 miles below New Orleans. And um, it, it's the middle of the night. Smith turns out can't see at night very well. And, and Farragut likes to run run forts at night. And and Dewey gets, the, the Mississippi gets pounded. And Dewey is in command the whole time. Uh, and and it's, it's, it, was, it, was, uh, it was an incredible experience for him. Baptism under fire. Absolutely. You know, it sounds like he maintained his cool throughout it all. Yeah. And, and, and Smith writes him up by name and, and says that, you know, he deserves credit for keeping the ship, you know, in line and, and, and really, like you said, maintaining his cool under fire. And he's going to be known as cool under fire from that point on. And, and he's, he's, he's young still. Uh, he does occupation duty in New Orleans, and this is important too. He understands, he learns at New Orleans, watching Farragut, that a fleet on the water has trouble projecting power ashore, even into a town that has all but surrendered. Right, A fleet ashore can't really do anything with a town until the army gets there. And that whole, that thing's going to come back at Manila too, of course. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that was in 62, early in 63, Farragut takes the Mississippi and therefore George Dewey further up river. They run the guns at a place called Port Royal in Mississippi and the USS Mississippi runs aground at that point. And uh, it gets gets pummeled by Confederate guns, gets set on fire. It's it, he's got to abandon the ship. He runs up and down through the whole of the ship, looking for survivors, getting them off the boat and into the life, you know, the lifeboats, getting them to shore and back. It, it's a harrowing experience, but my gosh, it was formative. And he did he handled himself so well. It was very impressive. Yes, indeed, definitely a rising star in the fleet. So what about after the Civil War, that's sort of those sort of lean years for the fleet itself. And uh, I'm oh, sure yeah. officers trying to advance their careers. Jeez. How does he weather that sort of, I don't <laughs> even know, warm doldrum? <laughs> yeah, he, he weathers it. Hmm, he weathers it resentfully. You know, he, he resents the Congress. He resents the country for not building a Navy that that is commensurate with the United States and its growing influence and growing power. <laughs> You know, the, the United States comes out of the Civil War with numeral, you know, numerically the largest Navy in the world. But it gets cut back, as you know, just precipitously. And Dewey spends the next couple of decades cruising the Atlantic, you know, cruising the Med on ships that saw duty in the Civil War. Cruising the Med alongside new ships from, from Japan, from England, from France. And feeling this really sharp sense of the United States being left behind uh, in terms of naval technology, in terms of the willingness of the country to, to float a modern Navy. Uh, there's one episode that's really important in his life in that he's finally given command of a ship and he's going to take it to the South Seas. He's taking it to the Pacific. And he's going to go through the Atlantic. He's going to go through the Med. He's going to go through the Suez Canal for the first time. And he gets sick. Uh, his health was always sort of sketchy, actually. He gets sick in, while he's at sea. And uh, doctors examine him and he lies and says he's fine. And, and finally, he gets to the point where he's on the verge of, of uh, he's got a severe, severe liver infection and an abscess. And, and he, he at Malta, he gets to Malta. The British Naval Hospital there takes him ashore, does emergency surgery. His ship, the Juniata, goes on and, and sails to the South Pacific without him. Uh, and, and he almost dies. He's in the hospital at Malta for months. And they do, they take out a big chunk of his liver. They put a tube in to drain. 
I talked to a couple of my doctors here, told them the story, and let them read some of what I had written. And my doctors said, this guy's lucky to be alive. And he, and he was. Um, and, and he spends, gosh, he spends the bulk of 1881 into 1882 trying to restore his health. He finally comes back to the States, uh, but he came close to dying. And it takes a long time for him to get his strength back up. But he finally does. And uh, he, he, he gets into this pattern that, that, you, that you know exists of doing a float and a shore, a float and a shore. And he begins to sort of work his way up through places like the Bureau of Equipment and the Bureau of Personnel, Bureau of Navigation. He, he works his way up the, 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 the stateside chain of command the administrative Navy, and it gives him a very clear appreciation of sort of the Navy from both sides, from the desk and from the bridge. And when he gets command of the uh, East Asia Squadron in the fall of 97, there's really no one that has the experience and the knowledge of the fleet, both operationally and technologically that that he has you know he he saw and i write about this in the book i love this scene he sees the plans for the olympia come across his desk and he studies them and he reviews them and and it doesn't even have a name at that point but that's the ship he's going to to win his fame on How about that yeah so what about his relationship with the uh assistant secretary of the navy uh fellow named theodore roosevelt they seem like <laughs> very simpatico and both of them very much in line with the um thinking that attended to the birth of our organization the u.s naval institute right uh where this fleet is falling way behind uh um, yeah. kind of losing our way that's of course correct He's right yeah. in line with all of that zeitgeist. Absolutely, he is. Yeah, I mean, and Dewey is is one of the people pushing that zeitgeist to really remake the Navy into a modern force. And by the time Theodore Roosevelt comes to Washington for the first time as a civil service commission under under President Harrison, Dewey has already made a name. And Theodore Roosevelt is always ready to be impressed by men taking action. And he reads stories about George Dewey. There's an episode uh, when there was a war scare with uh, with uh, Chile in Valparaiso, mm -hmm. and and Dewey arranges for coal to be sent down to the South Atlantic to be ready just in case there's a war. And Theodore Roosevelt was very impressed with that. He was very impressed with Dewey taking action and getting ready, being prepared. And when, when Roosevelt becomes assistant secretary of the Navy in the McKinley administration in March of 97, Dewey gains someone in the Navy department, you know, right at the top, who, who knows him and who thinks the world of him as a fighter, as an aggressive person. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's role in getting Dewey the, the gig as commander of the East Asia Squadron, and then the whole bit about Manila, Theodore Roosevelt's role has been overblown a lot. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt didn't turn Dewey loose. You know, Theodore Roosevelt didn't tell Dewey what to do. Dewey knew what to do. But uh, it, it's, it's interesting in that Theodore Roosevelt has almost over, overshadowed Dewey almost overshadowed Dewey in, in the run-up to the Battle of Manila Bay, which is, which is pretty inaccurate. Hmm. The, the, Naval, the Office of Naval Intelligence and the new Naval War College had drawn up plans to attack Manila, not for the purpose of annexation, but you know, for the purpose of you know, using it as a bargaining chip and taking out the Spanish fleet while we knew where it was. And... Uh, and Theodore Roosevelt's role in that has been grossly exaggerated. Why do you think that is? Could it be the fact that it's part of the narrative of how he's um, drumming up this war and it's yeah. all part of that overall TR narrative that you always hear? Exactly. Like that. It, that, that's exactly what it is. He, he you know, he he retires his position. He resigns his position in the, in the Navy Department to to put together the Rough Riders and he goes to Cuba and he fights, you know. 
and then comes back and translates that celebrity, that military heroism into uh, the governorship of New York in, in uh, the fall of 98. So it's, it's this, it's that in Theodore Roosevelt, we have a popular and, you know, he becomes president in 01. We, we have this aggressive, energetic go-getter and it, it, it's sort of easy to graft the Manila story onto him rather than this quiet, reticent, non-headline-seeking, eminently com competent naval officer. It, this, the story, the drama, is just a better fit for Roosevelt in the sure. eyes of the public. So Roosevelt um, thought the world of Dewey. Would it, did Dewey reciprocate his, this, that admiration for TR? Uh, this pretty particular? clearly, yeah. I, I think they got along really well, uh, especially after Roosevelt becomes president. He has Dewey to the White House a lot. Mm. And, you know, Dewey living in D.C. at that time. And he has Dewey to the White House a lot. And, and Dewey likes that. You know, Dewey likes being at the center of things. And he certainly appreciates uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt give, giving him giving him uh, attention. Yeah, you know it's interesting to ponder um, if he hadn't become sort of politically toxic by way of the marriage, right. the idea of a T.R. Uh, Dewey ticket, presidential ticket, that would have been unstoppable. Yeah. <clears throat> wow, if that that you know that that's a good idea. That would have been unstoppable um, at that point in time in America. Yeah, if in 1904 was when it would have gone down, right? Yeah. Um, you know, he he comes out in April of 1900, and I think it's under a lot of the a lot of a lot of pressure from his wife because his 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 new wife is from a very very prominent Democratic family, and her brother had run and for governor of Ohio and lost, and. Uh, I, I think she wanted her husband to sort of pick up the mantle of the the family and the party leadership and, and take the Democratic nomination away from that radical William Jennings Bryan that everybody, you know, mainstream Democratic thought thought he was a radical. And and somebody somebody said to Dewey after this whole thing washed out, you know, and the press had turned on him and published some pretty scathing cartoons about his candidacy. Somebody said, you know. I think you would be a good president in the future. This just isn't the time for you now. And I tell you what, if he had, if he had stuck around, if he hadn't gotten, you know, if he had, hadn't, you know, continued with his Navy career, um, if he had been a little bit, played his game a little bit differently, Theodore Roosevelt would have loved to have him on the ticket in 04. At least mm -hmm. I think he would have, yeah. What a lineup that would have been. Yeah. Well, what about his post uh, Spanish American War career? Let's delve into that a little bit. Uh, you know, they, the con Congress creates this rank for him. You know, in their enthusiasm to celebrate Dewey, Congress creates the rank of Admiral of the Navy. It had never existed before, it has never existed since. He's the only person to hold this rank. And it basically says that he's on active duty until he dies. And so basically the Navy has to try to find something to do with Dewey and Dewey doesn't want to go to sea again. You know, he's, he's been ashore after the battle of Manila Bay too long. He wants to, he wants to contribute in some other way. How old is he at this point? Uh, when, he, when he comes home from the Philippines, he's 61. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's not a, not a spring chicken. Uh, and like I said, his, his health wasn't all that good. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a there's this is interesting there's an episode uh when in the caribbean the british and the german fleets show up off the coast of venezuela and venezuela has announced that it's defaulting on its debts it can't pay its debts to britain and and, and germany and the germans and the british send fleets to venezuela and, and what they're doing is they're looking for influence in the Caribbean because everybody knows that someday soon there's going to be a canal dug, you know. And, and, and Roosevelt, this is 1902, Roosevelt's president. Roosevelt regards, you know, the, the Monroe Doctrine as sacrosanct. He wants to protect the Caribbean. And Roosevelt organizes, along with the Navy Department, the first sort of full fleet exercise in the Caribbean. 
and he puts Dewey in command of it. Hmm. And he Roosevelt puts Dewey in command of it because Dewey is the most famous sailor in the world, and everybody knows he's a fighter. And Roosevelt says, I put Dewey in command because he's a fighter, and he wants to send a message, as we say, to the British and the Germans. And Dewey takes command of this fleet and they do these huge exercises in this big arc, you know, in the Caribbean, basically from the coast of uh, South America all the way up to uh, Puerto Rico, which is now a U.S. colony, of course. And then over toward, uh, what would that be, over toward Jamaica, I guess. And and the the press covers it extensively and the headlines are all you know, fighting Dewey takes the fleet to the Caribbean, you know, sending a message to the Germans and the British. So Roosevelt uses Dewey as the big stick. You know, Roosevelt says, speak softly and carry a big stick. Roosevelt speaks softly and Dewey is his big stick, if that's not too strange an image. Um, and then the, United, the, the Navy creates the General Board of the Navy as its first peacetime planning board and they put Dewey in as president of the general board in part to insulate the general board from criticism and from sniping and from competition because Dewey the world's most famous sailor is blessing the board with his leadership mm -hmm. and and the general board of the navy is incredibly important because that's the group that draws up war plans, including the first iterations of War Plan Orange that the United States will use in World War II. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, he's got his his footprint all over the rise of the modern Navy, and that's kind of sort of yeah. the theme of your book, is it not? It really is. You know, I, I, I didn't go into it thinking that was going to be the theme. I wanted to just basically write a straight biography of George Dewey, but I realized that the story I was telling was the story of the Navy itself and its rise to prominence, its rise to being a serious global presence. You know, by, by the time of Manila Bay, Dewey has grown up with this Navy. And it, it, it's sort of like Dewey and the Navy come out on stage at the same time and set the, set the stage for the United States being a great power in the 20th century. Such a huge... Um figure in uh the navy story at he this re he at really this is you know he really is there's nobody like him and this is a long overdue biography so i'm i was thrilled to see this was coming out and um here it is the 125th anniversary so I was, uh we wanted to put this in the may june issue because mm -hmm. of the battle of manila you know i i i i cut that chapter down by about Jeez, <laughs> by about 6,500 words mm -hmm. to fit it into the magazine. And that, that was painful. That, those, those, those are some hard I know. Points, right? I know. Yeah. Real estate's always at a premium in terms of a Absolutely. copy yeah. inch count in a magazine or a book. Oh, yeah. I, I've, I've written newspaper columns regularly here, you know, in town. And, and I know that when the newspaper shrinks, you know, columns shrink, too. Yeah, the art almost comes to becomes how to write it shorter yeah. at the outset. So you're gonna have to break your heart and <laughs> take out all the good parts you had. Yeah. But the good parts are still in the book. So uh, yeah, there you go. And uh, this, this is just book, yeah, yeah, this is merely an excerpt, folks. You've got to read the whole book. I highly Absolutely. recommend it. Um, it's it's a uh, it's not only a timely and important and uh, like I say, long overdue biography of a, a massively iconic U.S. naval figure, but um, it's quite well written as well and insightful. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. It's great to talk with you, Dave. I can see now um, sort of the talent behind the writing. And uh, it's great to talk to you too. I appreciate this. This is I, I'll talk I'll talk about Dewey to anybody and everybody. That's wonderful. Well, um, uh, we hope that people will um, get this book and um, get a lot out of it because we have here and. Um, it's a real pleasure having you on here, Dave, and I thank you for taking the time to join us today. Absolutely, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime. Maybe you'll come up with another topic of uh, naval interest. I, I will. I've got a couple of things in mind already. Okay, now I'm intrigued. All right. Yeah, I've already Dave. started, in fact. Wonderful. Okay, well, we'll leave people in suspense, but uh, 
I'll look forward to talking to you about that as uh, we go forward. Well, thanks for joining us, Dave. It's been a pleasure. You, Eric. It has been a pleasure. I've enjoyed this a lot. Me too. Well, I guess that's it for this uh, episode of the Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. Until next time, I bid you farewell. This is Eric Mills signing out.